I mean, Gary Haggerty, what an incredible uh, witness, given his own background and what he's admitted to. Um, I have to say, when you kind of look into him a little bit, you go, how could anybody believe a word out of his mouth? And the judge kind of, unfortunately for the families, uh, agreed with that. Is it is it that he's just too big a criminal or was there problems with the corroborating evidence? It really was down to the corroborating evidence because we have been here before, like we've been here actually several times before. But if we go back to the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act, which allowed the prosecution to use people as assistant offenders, supercrosses, informers, whatever you want to call them. That was introduced in 2005. And then after that, we had the case of the Stewart brothers, Ian and Robert Stewart, who were two members of the Mount Vernon UVF, along with Gary Haggerty, Mark Haddock, people like that. They said they would turn state's evidence in the case against numerous um, former associates who were linked to the murder of a guy called Tommy English. He had been a a UDA commander living in Mount Vernon. The UVF and UDA were feuding with each other. They targeted him and killed him. Um, And they were given evidence against them. It was a massive trial in terms of media attention because it was the first time we'd had a Supergrass trial in Northern Ireland since the the 80s and those infamous Supergrass trials that took place in Crumlin Road Courthouse against members of the IRA, INLA, UVF, all of which nearly all ended in um, being dismissed appeal. So... Huge interest that day. And, you know, as a side note, it was the first time we were allowed to tweet from live from a court. Did Mr. Justice Gillen give us permission to tweet because of the importance of the case? But within, I would say within five minutes of um, the cross-examination of the Stewart brothers, I remember thinking this is going nowhere. They are probably the worst, most dishonest witnesses I have ever came across. And in fact, among all the charges and offences that they had been charged with, which were taken into consideration, they were given a dramatically reduced sentence because of that. They were um, taking schoolgirls who were like, you know, 13, 14 years of age and um, filled them full of drink and drugs and basically abusing them. And that was among the charges that one of those brothers had taken into consideration, you know, basically a sex offender. I mean, it's Mm. a pedophilia. Um, And, you know, I'll never forget the day when he was being cross, one of them was being cross examined in relation to that. And he pointed to all his former associates sitting in the dock, all these UVF men. And the um, barrister says, is it true you were abusing little girls in their school uniform? And he pointed and went, yeah, they were all doing it. We were all doing it. Oh, Um, it was horrendous. Mm. Anyway, the judge ended just saying these are the most dishonest human beings. Nobody got convicted um, in relation to it. They all walked one person got done just because there was CCTV. It showed him about a sledgehammer. But apart from that, everybody else um, got off with that. And after that, the prosecution, which was then led by Barry McGorry, said, we really need to look at this. This system is maybe not. This is not maybe, you know, the SACO legislation isn't maybe our golden ticket to be able to solve all these um, legacy crimes. So we were all called in to the PPS and we were told there will be no more supergrass trials. And bear in mind at this time, Martin O'Hagan, your colleague of yours in the Sunday world, who had been murdered by the LVF, a guy called Neil Hyde, had agreed to be assistant offender and give evidence against the people who were alleged to have killed Martin O'Hagan. Neil Hyde was taken under witness protection. He was given a reduced sentence despite admitting involvement in the murder of the journalist. Um, and he never, ever gave a day as evidence against anyone because they said supergrass trials can't be trusted. All of the people that Haggerty had given information on, including his two handlers, we were told they wouldn't be prosecuted. But Jimmy Smith, also known as Jimmy Shades, we were told that case could go on because there was other corroborating evidence that mm. link Smith to the murder of um, a guy called, two guys called Eamon Fox and Gary um, Convey, who were just two Catholic workmen working on a building site in a pretty loyalist Protestant area of Belfast. And that corroborating evidence was DNA, yeah? There was DNA on a jacket, which I think Haggerty had told um, his handlers where this jacket was stored. And then there was some identification evidence. And then there was Haggerty's evidence. But it just didn't stack up because there was questions around. It was the use of a sort of thing. It was like a green wax sort of jacket, like a sort of barber coat that Haggerty said that um, Smith had used to hide the stenched submachine gun. Mm. But some of the eyewitnesses were given testimony saying that, you know, could a tall man or someone about five foot ten. And, you know, I was sitting in the court looking at Smith sitting in the, the dock and clearly that wasn't him. He's, you know, he's five foot four, if he even is that, you know, mm. he's a tiny, tiny little person. Um, 
Haggerty's evidence was much more convincing than the Stewart brothers in that he didn't try to diminish his own involvement. He was asked about things. He he had previously pleaded guilty to five murders, numerous attempted murders. And I think it was, you know, hundreds, and I mean hundreds of terror related charges spanning over a lengthy period of time. Um, they were all taken into consideration. He did just months in, in prison in relation to those. He was very open that this is this was his past, that he'd been a paramilitary, that he'd been a terrorist, that he'd been involved in very serious criminality. So that part of it made him sort of, I suppose, slightly more convincing as, as a witness. Um, he got agitated a few times when he was asked, you know, are you a serial killer? And he was like, well, no. You know, and I think he says I, I was only directly involved in one of those murders or whatever, rather than um, as an accessory to them. It, mm. He seemed to try to justify a lot of this in his own head. But, you know, bizarrely as well, the prosecution took, um, there was a, an injunction placed just before the trial took place saying that we couldn't use um, court illustrators or even write a description of what he looked like now, what his appearance looked like now. I don't know, for, obviously he lives in, in witness protection for what reason. I'm told that Haggerty didn't ask for that himself, um, whether he did. But the trial made headlines literally around the world because on day one, mm. Jimmy Smith brought with him an entourage. He basically did a show of strength, guys from from uh, supporters of his, he showed up in the court mast. Um, and I don't mean just walking in there. Like, you cover the courts, I cover the courts. You know people try and cover their faces. They pull their hoods up, mm. they put scars around their faces. They don't want to be photographed. They don't want people like us, you know, taking their picture and putting them in the paper. But the minute they get to the door of the court, the security in the court would immediately go, right, you know, get that off. Mm. Instead, these boys sat in the public gallery of the court, just feet away from the families of the victims, of the two people who had been murdered, with masks on, dark glasses, hats pulled down. And it wasn't until the court break, you know, had a break for lunch, that the solicitor for the two grieving families had mentioned this to police and said, is someone actually going to do something about this? Because there was police standing in the court, standing in the public gallery at the back wall, watching this by this, you know, gang of thugs, basically, um, tried to intimidate. Whether the intimidation was aimed at Haggerty or the families, or yeah. the other, I'm just not sure. And did the judge not call them out and ask the police in the courtroom? I mean, I can imagine right. that happening here, that the judge would call them out and say, look, this is my courtroom, you don't behave like that in here. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether the judge was focused on Smith, focused on Haggerty. The, the courts, you know, it was the biggest court in, like I said, and there's glass partition between um, the public gallery and the rest of the court. I was sitting in the press box and I could see them quite clearly and I could see the police officer stand behind him and I kept thinking at some point he's clearly going to say, mm. boys, get your mask down or get out. But no, it didn't happen. The judge didn't say anything until... And then after lunchtime, he said, the judge did say, you know, it's brought to my attention um, that there are people with their faces covered, either remove any face coverings or else you'll be, you know, asked to leave um, the public gallery of the court. And so that sort of put an end to it, as in put an end in the court. They still arrive for those days of Haggerty's evidence, you know, masked up mm. um, outside coming in and out of the court. But yeah. they were stopped by and the police presence was was quite heavy from then on in the court to ensure that there was no repeat of that. So does your DPP not flag up that this corroborating evidence isn't good enough, isn't strong enough before it hits the court, before there's the cost, the expense? And I was referring earlier um, on an interview I was doing with the BBC about the story you had at the time that when Haggerty was over giving evidence, he'd been flown in in on a private jet. The cost of this is just phenomenal. So does somebody not look and go, that evidence actually is going to be torn apart in, in the courtroom and all we have left is Haggerty's, um, you know, evidence, which is not going to be accepted without corroboration? Yeah, I mean, this case, bear in mind, Haggerty was recruited um, to be a state witness in 2009 and this trial took place in October last year. So that's how much of a length of time. There was over a thousand interviews. I think, you know, there was tens of thousands of pages of information. His debriefs, which took place um, in a, a police station or an army base, went on for a long time. He was flown um, back and forward by helicopter during this time to be de- to be debriefed. This case is cost millions to end in a no prosecution. The the evidence, maybe they thought that there was DNA evidence um, on that jacket linking Smith to it, but it was on the, um, I think it's when I remember there was evidence on the collar of the jacket, but there was also evidence linked to someone else. 
And all the, the, the defence had to do was introduce enough doubt that this could have been someone else. They, they basically tried to imply that it was Mark Haddock. Mark Haddock's currently in prison in England, serving a prison sentence for trying to stab mm. one of his former friends. Um, and he was also a special branch informer. At the same t- at the time, both um, Haddock and Haggerty had been um, uncovered as a special branch informer because of the Operation Ballast Report. That was the former Ombudsman Nulo Lone had carried out an investigation into the Mount Vernon UVF. Um, so Haggerty had already sort of fled to England. He was pretty isolated at the time. And if you're convicted of anything that happened before 1988, any troubles related to defence in Northern Ireland, you only served two years in prison. But some of these um, killings and some of these offences had taken place after 1998, some of them had taken place in the 2000s. So he would have been looking at a full life sentence, at least, or at least 15 years. Um, so he was sort of prime picking if he wanted to pick out someone. I was told that Mark Haddock also offered up his services as a state witness, but was deemed, but was refused. He was deemed too hot to almost touch, um, and Haggerty was. The, the problem with it is, is it, it's... The case was easily, all you have to do in a criminal case is, you know, is introduce doubt. It has to be, to, to convict someone to a criminal standard, it has to be beyond reasonable doubt. Mm. And if you introduce enough doubt, well then, whether there's a jury or, as in this case, so these are non-jury courts, you know, basically special criminal court because they're terrorist related, we don't have juries. Um, it was Mr Justice O'Hara sitting alone. Whether it's a jury or a judge, if there's enough doubt, they will not convict. And so that's what happened in this case. It's incredibly sad for the families who, you know, arrived every day of mm. this trial. And despite such provocation, including, you know, mass men sitting in the public gallery, handled themselves with such, such dignity. Um, you know, in, in terms of Eamon Fox had, I think he had six children, I think I'm right, one of his children, Karen Fox, was there every day, just such a lovely um, gentleman and supporting the rest of his family. And um, Gary Convey had just, I think his partner had just had a baby. And this, you know, mm. woman, God love her, you know, showed up every every day to hear this evidence. Um, and she had been such a young woman when this happened to her and this was, was grief was upon her and she's lived with that for, you know, it's it'll be be 30 years that the families have had to live with this. Their hopes were dashed. And a lot happened in Legacy this week. We had other High Court rulings in terms of the, the proposed amnesty um, and in relation to that, as well as then Haggerty with information that came out about the Sean Brown inquest. It's been a very heavy legacy filled week here mm. and you do get the impression that these kind of cases are going to come to they've cut they're coming to an end this will be the last supergrass trial we'll never see another trial like that again um and it was i mean in terms of from a news point of view it was just a case that you couldn't even have made up half there you you touched on the fact that haggerty was brought in to give his evidence on a private jet that private jet belongs to the british government and had been used just a few days previously to fly Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, somewhere. Um, Haggerty then had to stay in um, Belfast after he gave evidence, I think, for two days because the private jet was in use by British government officials. So, I mean, you know, driving, you know, flying a basically self-confessed killer mm. um, and paramilitary around in a, a private jet. He was he stayed, I believe, in a um, in an army base just on the outskirts of, of Belfast, while he was here as well for his own protection. But yeah, I mean, fleeing on the premise. Yeah, and look, I suppose that gives an impression that maybe Haggerty's living it up. And my experience of a lot of these people that go state witness or are super grasses because they are two different things, they don't usually live this sort of extravagant lifestyle in the aftermath. They tend to live a very lonely life Um they are kind of sucked up some ways and spat out by the system as well. Um, and I suppose it's dreadful for those two families to have had got, have to go through that and to see a convicted killer, uh, Smith, because he's he's already a convicted yeah. murderer who the judge said showed he was happy to murder Catholics for being Catholics. To see him walk free and the empowerment that will give him and his supporters for whatever length of time they feel it. But you know, you can be damn sure that he'll feel very powerful that he has beaten the system. But on the system, you know, did you think we're not here to judge the judges, OK? Yeah. And I'm not going to put you in an uncomfortable position that you'll be sitting in Judge O'Hara's court someday and he'll, 
give you the finger, Miss Morris, I want to word it to you, but do you think that it was the right judgment, I suppose, sometimes we can say that, that the, the enough doubt had been cast by the defence? You can, you know, I think we have set through so many trials now, I can always tell what way that they're going to go. And I, I was pretty sure that this one would have ended in no conviction because there was just enough doubt. There was one day... Um, whenever the defence introduced a couple of issues really to do with the height and also the fact that they had had you know, realised that Haggerty didn't like Jimmy Smith, he didn't like Jimmy Shades. He, he actually had said he was on the run, basically. He was sent to live um, in Newton Abbey. They were looking after him or taking care of him because he was on the run uh, having killed a guy in Balamina and uh, attempted to murder his wife just a few months previously. And Haggerty had been put in charge, if you like, of looking after his welfare, as they called it. And he just didn't like him. He, you know, he rather than keep his head down, as you would imagine, someone who's meant to be on the, the run for, for a murder, he was partying and drinking. And there was people, you know, claiming that they'd been singing UVF songs out in the street and all sorts of other things. He was just, I think he was just a nuisance and he clearly didn't like him. Mm. Um, and so the prosecution or the defense is sort of introduced that element of it and the fact that there's a very real possibility that could have been Mark Haddock was the killer is and that he fitted probably the description of the eyewitnesses better. And he definitely, you know, was on the scene somewhere. I mean, Haggerty says that him and, and another guy were eating nice lollies across the road watching the murders taking place. Um, and these, the, the two victims in this case, they were two Catholic workmen, I think they're electricians. Um, and they've been working on this site, which was, I said, in quite a, a sort of loyalist area. And because there was them and maybe a few other Catholics, but not very many working on the site, they'd been identified by someone else who worked there as a Catholic and this information had been passed on and they didn't eat their lunch with everyone else. They ate their lunch sitting in their car every day because mm. I don't think they felt overly welcomed um, on the building site where they were working and that was obviously where they were targeted. There was another guy sitting in the back seat and he he escaped. He was, he was injured, but he wasn't killed. Um, and it is just, you know, when you think about, you know, a hard working, two hard working men out trying to earn money, you know, to put food on the table and shoes on their kids' feet and to be targeted by these utter scumbags, which mm. is what they were. I mean, yeah. they listened to even the lifestyle that they were living and the, they were constantly in shabines and they were drinking and taking drugs. And, you know, and it, it wasn't like as if these were, you know, UVF men at war with the IRA. They weren't mm. going toe to toe with the IRA as their, their enemy. They were literally just picking the easiest of target, anyone who was a Catholic and they were murdering them for that sake, just mm. purely sectarian um, and the easiest targets they could find. So it was incredibly distressing for their families. It was, you know, it was kind of mad case to sit through in terms of the ups and downs of it and everything that was said, you know, between mass men in the court and private jets and prime mm. ministers and everything else. I mean, you just throw everything at it. Um, and I don't know where the families go from now because, you know, many of the avenues that would have been open to them in the past have been closed down by the British government. So I'm not sure what the, the next move is, but, you know. So I suppose we should point out that, um, you know, this these murders happened 30 years ago. Now, nowadays, things have become so technical that the corroborating evidence, as we call it, would be there in the forms of, you know, phone masks, yeah. you know, um, CCTV and other sorts of technology. Um and unfortunately, they just aren't there in these sort of legacy yeah. cases. So, you know, I'm not looking for blame here, but did the did the state let down these victims' families by not having a robust enough case to take? Should they ever have put them through this trial in the first place when knowing that Haggerty's um, evidence alone wouldn't be enough? Um, or do we just move on and take and, and realize yeah. that some of these murders are unsolvable, unfortunately, because the the class of evidence that's there just isn't good enough in a, in a in a modern courtroom? You know, like we can't be in a position that we're going forward fighting organized crime or terrorism without having criminals in the witness box because they're the only guys <laughs> or women who really are close enough to the action to have the proper information that's needed sometimes to convict. Um, yeah. Where do we go? Like there, there won't be super grasses, but I mean, the, the witness protection program will remain in place. There will be state witnesses. We will have state witnesses, but we'll never. I don't think they'll ever use that sample legislation again. And yeah. the way that they have, like, not it is not. The, it was not the way to police the past. It just wasn't. It hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. It hasn't worked for a whole raft raft of reasons. 
um, including, you know, witnesses not telling the complete their whole truth. I'm not sure. I think Haggerty was happy enough to tell the truth. But the problem was, is he started then, rather than just tell the truth on his former associates, he started telling um, the truth about his police handlers as well. And that then put the, the prosecution, I don't know whether everything entered into a whole different realm there. And obviously he knows what was said in open court could be reported. So he was just trying to spit as much of that out as he possibly could. Um, it's I mean, interesting because a lot of those people, you know, and, and many of them who have been sort of in that secretive um, place where they have handlers, they're in protection, that kind of thing. They are, okay, Haggerty's a criminal. He's admitted to, what, 500 terror crimes and uh, his role in a number of murders. Yeah. But once they go into that, you know, agreement to be an informant and, and to get up in court and give evidence and they go into protection, they become very vulnerable and they can be treated pretty much any way because who's going to believe them? Who else listens to them? Where do they ever get to tell their story again? Gary Haggerty's disappeared into the ether unless he leaves a tape or something and, and after he dies, his... Well, I mean, his, uh, there's tens of thousands of pages of evidence that he gave during his debrief, which will be, you know, around long after he's he's gone. And the thing about it is, is you wonder, does the quality of your witness protection depend on you playing that game, on you making sure that you don't reveal the state secret, you know, stick mm. to giving information on your criminal mates, but not anybody else? Because, you know, if we look at the like of Freddie Scapatishi, the of Steak Knife, um, his life was in a, a very affluent middle class area of, of England. You know, he lived in this sort of beautiful home. He drove a very flash car. He was obviously being looked after um, because he played the game. Whereas, you know, I'm told, you know, with Haggerty that he actually had to get benefits and obviously had a problem getting those benefits because his identity isn't what his, you know, his identity is false. Um, and therefore, if, you know, you try and go and claim benefits, you can't go and do it just with, you know, a fake ID and a fake birth certificate, which, you know, you'd be given I'm assuming in, in witness protection. So there's a whole big issue around that. So, no, I don't think he's living he's mm -hmm. living the high life. Um, and I don't think he should be living the high life either, because, you know, given what he was involved in in the past, I think, you know, that that whole sort of murderous and former ridden Mount Vernon UVF squad were just, you know, involved in the most despicable of crimes. They really were. But it's not a position we want either, though, that there's, you know, people working for the state on the state book and that are allowed to behave whichever way they want to pick and choose who, yeah. who gets to um, go into a really fancy witness protection, who gets a shit one. I mean, <laughs> you know, we don't really want that either, do we? Right, if you live today, this is what always baffles me mm. about these informer stories, especially about our legacy. Who said who got to live and die? So if the informer, okay, sometimes you might not know that a killing's going to take place till afterwards. And so then you go and you give your handlers all the information that you know about what actually happened. But in many cases, they're going, and Haggerty was saying, you know, there's going to be someone attacked because we're test firing a, a, um, a stand machine gun because so there, there was such riddle with informers that what they were doing is they were taking guns, giving them to their handlers. Their handlers were disarming the guns and giving them them back and they were putting them back in arm stumps. So then they were going to, have to do attacks and the weapons weren't working. So because, you know, they, they, they basically clocked that this was happening before an attack, they had to go and test fire um, a weapon and Haggerty went with this guy to like a railway station off of York Road to the railway tracks and, and test fire the stand machine gun that was going to be used against the attack of the two Catholic workmen. He says he told his handlers all of this and they were aware beforehand. So, you know, at what point do they say, you know, they go, well, if we had have acted on this, we could have compromised our agent. But at what point are you compromising the lives of innocent people to protect your agent? And, and it's why you call it, they call it a dirty war. It's just mm. murky as anything, you know, in terms of what went on um, and the collusion that existed between informers who were allowed in some cases to, you know, kill with impunity you know in, in terms of that and okay they maybe save lives but they also were taking lives too mm. and innocent lives of innocent people um i mean one of the people among the people that that were they were killed by that um that wing of the uvf there was a, a girl called sharon mckenna who was you know they called the good samaritan killing she was going to an elderly protestant man's house she used to call and do some shopping for him or bring him food or whatever they killed her there was another guy who was like a grandfather who was just babysitting his grandkids and they went into the house um, and shot him when the wee children were still in, in the house. You know, it was just, 
it was they were appalling killings of a sectarian nature mm. um you know and, and that is why justice o'hara did say i mean he also said obviously that Haggerty was you know wasn't a, a, the most truthful of witness but he also said to, to smith you know when he was leaving you know you don't leave here without a stain on your character i mean that's that's why he made the point of saying you were someone who killed catholics just because they were catholics mm. So while he was found not guilty of this offence, he's, he's a far from innocent man. So Smith is free now. He's just gone home to wherever he lives. He walked out of the court with his face covered and his hood up, waving mm. his fist in the air, delighted with himself. Mm. And all his friends with him. Um, yeah. yeah. OK, a grim week enough up there, isn't there? It's actually been such a busy week, but such a depressing week too, mm. in terms of having, you know, we really do need to have a mature conversation about our past and how we're going to deal with it, because clearly this isn't the way. You know, I, this is just further traumatising people. I was desperately trying to find a criminal angle in the stripper story, but I couldn't. Listen, it is the talk of the place. I was in the hairdressers last week and people wanted to talk about nothing else, apart from the Pleasure Boys and the stripping. Um, and the conversations that I heard in our office, including one journalist who had to speak to one of the pleasure boys and he had quite a common name so so that she could distinguish him from other people of the same name in her phone. She said she put a um, uh, aubergine emoji beside his name. <laughs> it's saved in her phone so that we're aware that that's the stripper. Mm. Now, just so that you know. Yes. I tried to show the videos to my um, 80-year-old mother, but she wasn't having any of it. She called me a dirty bass and told me to take them out of her face. So is the is the kind of the, the shock and awe about the strippers and what they were doing, or is it about the reaction of the female <laughs> guests that had paid to go to see them? Which is it? Well, I mean, there was, a, there was a lot of pearl clutching going on. And, you know, I think that, you know, how many men have been away on stag and hen weekends and went to strip clubs and things like that. And yet the minute they thought that a woman was doing it, um, it wouldn't be my cup of tea. I'd literally rather be able to males than go and, and watch male strippers. Um, but at the same time, you realise that there is a group of specifically Irish men yeah. who really don't like loud women. <laughs> 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 loud women <laughs> In a way that they seem inappropriate, and loud West Belfast women, well, they're like kryptonite to men like that. You know what I mean? They can't be having them at all. Um, I thought it was bloody hilarious. Some people thought they were outraged. One of the best quotes of the whole thing was um, Jessica, one of the Belfast Telegraph journalists, we did to do a vox pop in West Belfast, and some woman said, her, "I think it's disgraceful, especially during Lent." <laughs> 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 because the left angle made all the difference, you know. <laughs> that says it all, really, I think. <laughs> I think yes. we may. So if you're going to go and look at, um, at male strippers, try not and do it during the Holy Week, because that's terrible. That's terrible. And try not to be so grabby. Women are kind of grabby, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? There, was, there appeared to be a lot of grabbing going on. <laughs> And a lot of swinging. One of my friends who is of a much more innocent disposition than me asked me with a prosthetics. I don't think that she could quite believe that real. <laughs> um, but yeah, the pleasure boys seem to be loving it. They've got plenty of book instead of it. They about. certainly didn't complain. I mean, there was no <laughs> suggestion that any of that grabbing was going to be end up in a court of law or anything. So anyway, I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't find the angle, but I never thought of the Lent one. <laughs> Never thought of that. Yeah, Lent, yeah. Lent, Lent was the only angle that the, the Telegraph could come up with. That would have done. Right. Thanks a million. Have a good weekend. See you next week. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs, and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.